Hello everybody and welcome to the first lesson in a new series on land law. In this lesson what we're going to essentially be doing is talking about some of the introductory principles pertaining to land and the ownership of land as well as the various distinctions between different kinds of rights that exist in terms of and in relation to land and then we will outline the scope of this series at the end. This is the first lesson in the subject of land law. Like I've said, we are talking about some basic introductory issues which pertain to and relate to the nature of land, the nature of land ownership and the nature of rights uh, to land. All of which, of course, are very important for the study of land law. And we'll also outline the basic structure uh, of the series, which is going to be essentially the subject of the uh, of lessons in the next few weeks and months. So ordinarily, when we talk about law in relation to land, we can either define this as land law, as the name might suggest, but some textbooks and or university modules may describe this as a series of lessons on, quote, property law. And that's because in some circumstances, you might uh, essentially use the word land and the word property interchangeably. So, for example, if you get a mortgage, you'll be getting a mortgage on a property uh, and you're referring to a house or a flat, for example. And so as a result of which, we tend to sort of mix those two phrases together such that you may be studying property law and essentially doing the exact same thing as studying land law. I use land law uh, as, a, as a title owing to the fact that it seems to be the case that a lot of um, textbooks, most textbooks tend to use the, the phrase land law, but also because land law relates to more than just the law that, that talks about property, that talks about ownership of, uh, of a house or a flat or, or, or business premises, for example. It also talks about specific other kinds of rights that exist over land. So in this way, essentially, the it's it is uh, in in a way this is correct, given the fact that lessons on this subject are lessons about property in a way, uh, ownership of property, the transfer of property, and rights to enjoy said property. However, the fact that exists here is that we make a delineation between the kind of property that is purchased in reference to land law, i.e. land as a special kind of property, um, sometimes known as real property or realty, and the other kinds of property that may exist. So, for example, your phone or, or, or a table, that is being um, something known as personal property, for example. And so the property in this sense that we're talking about is um, actually land. We're talking about land itself. And the latter of these also gives rise to something known as, or at least within land law, we have uh, rise, uh, give rise to the idea of proprietary rights. And so land law and the study of proprietary rights is the study of rights in land specifically. So... While rights in land may also be personal rights, uh, we will get to that in future lessons time, the distinction between rights which are proprietary and rights which are personal is actually an integral part of the study of land law. In fact, if you're given a problem question uh, and you're asked to essentially talk about the purchase of, of, of land, purchase of property, and you're asked to talk about and identify the various third party interests in uh, a, p a particular piece of land, you might have to begin by talking about whether or not the interest in question uh, that is a third party interest is a proprietary right or a personal right. And in doing so, that will essentially change quite significantly the direction of your response to a problem question. So the ability to identify a proprietary right essentially allows uh, the owner of that right to enforce action against both the previous owner of the right and also in certain circumstances to against third parties. And so proprietary rights are considered to be very, very important when we talk about um, when we talk about land law specifically. They're seen as rights in the land itself sometimes described as the right in REM. That's what we're going to use um, in this uh, series of lessons. We'll talk about the concept of rights in REM as opposed to rights in persona, per, uh, personal rights. And so ultimately, one of the things that is quite uh, interesting in terms of um, 
in terms of the way in which we study land law in relation to the jurisdiction of England and Wales is talking about the concept of ownership and land ownership. Does it make sense to suggest that you own land? This is the first question. When you buy a property, do you own the land? Let's say you win the lottery, okay, and you don't have to have any kind of mortgage, you don't have to have any kind of issue related to that. You get given two million pounds and you go and you buy a house outright with cash, let's say. Um, when you do that, do you own the land itself? Do you Are you the, the rightful and sole owner of that property, of the land in which that property is built on? The, quite, the answer to that question is actually no. Uh, the technical answer is no. Um, we'll get into the reason why in future lessons when we look at the sort of historical develop of land ownership um, in relation to this subject. But for now, let's just talk a little bit about um, the actual ownership of land and something known as the idea of an estate in land. So in England and Wales, land ownership is technically the remit of the crown. Only the crown can own land and therefore all the property that you buy is not actually um, the, the transfer of ownership from a previous owner to you or even the transfer of ownership from the crown to you, for example. That's not how it works. In reality, individual persons do not have legal ownership to land per se, considering the fact that they own what are known as estates in land there are you own estates in land you don't own the land itself technically now in reality this is one of those little technical uh, things that uh, is a quite an idiosyncratic uh, example of why uh, of why england and wales is quite complicated in terms of how legal structuring works in this particular jurisdiction um but ultimately uh, in reality if you are somebody who owns a particular estate in the land in question we'll get to that in a second then you are for all intents and purposes the true owners of the land um, king charles isn't going to come along and kick you out of your property even though uh, land ownership is technically the remit of the crown now when it comes to estates in land we mainly divide these up into two distinct categories you have what is known as the freehold estate and you have what is known as the leasehold estate now ultimately when we talk about um, each of these things we're going to talk about them individually in more detail in, in future lessons time uh, but essentially the distinction that is made here is that with the freehold you are for all intents and purposes the owner of the property in the same way that um, you own any other kind of property um, even though technically like i've said it is the remit of the crown you are for all intents and purposes the owner of the freehold estate a leasehold estate gives you what is known as a slice of time so it gives you essentially the rights of a freehold owner but for a limited period and we'll get to the um the sort of street and mount requirements and characteristics of leasehold estates and the lease itself um, and see what actually uh, it takes for a lease to be formed uh, and what delineates a lease from the freehold and what delineates a lease from a license or a lease from an easement for example all of these different things we'll get to in future lessons time and speaking of which, let's talk about the scope of this series of lessons. We'll begin by talking about just a general introduction to land law. Uh, this is going to be looking at some introductory remarks. We're going to be looking at, for example, the history of la land ownership, the way land and the view of land uh, throughout the history of, of England and Wales, talking about the concept of feudal rights, talking about the way in which this develops into the modern system of land registration, for example, uh, the Law of Property Act 1925, etc, etc, etc. We will then also talk about, at the beginning of this series of lessons, the delineation that can be made between legal and equitable rights in land. Now, ultimately, um, one of the things that is often quite difficult for, for some law students to, to get their heads around is this distinction between legal rights and equitable rights. And this is often not uh, helped by the fact that if you study land law before you study equity and trusts, for example, or vice versa, uh, then you're going to uh, essentially um, be hampered in one way or another, depending on your, your in-depth understanding of, of equity and equitable rights. Um, but we will cover uh, briefly the distinction between legal and equitable rights in land in the first few lessons and essentially what we will do is whenever this comes back up um, so for example when we look at co-ownership and when we look at trusts of land we will see that there is um, a distinction that is made between legal and equitable rights there it is also made in various other circumstances as well
We will then move on to looking at the actual substantive detail of this course. We will talk firstly about the registered title system, the concept of registered land, the registration of land and the land registry, the, 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 the process by which land is registered, and also talking about interests which are protected by the land register uh, when it comes to um, when it comes to the, the the fundamental characteristics of the land registry and the importance of it. This will mean engaging with uh, several pieces of legislation, talking about, for example, the the Law of Property Act as well as the 2002 Land Registration Act. We will then move on to talking about the unregistered title system. Uh, unregistered title system is uh, an increasingly um, shrinking area of the law, given the fact that essentially the long and short of this particular topic is that um, where a conveyance or where the purchase of or, or, or the a disposition of unregistered title takes place, um, this um, automatically then becomes registered land as we as we have more and more land being entered into into the land registry. So the idea of unregistered title and the amount of unregistered title that exists in England and Wales is shrinking um, for as much as <laughs> increasingly so. We'll talk about the ownership of unregistered title, the transfer of unregistered title, as well as legal and equitable property rights within the unregistered title system. We'll look at land charges, the Land Charges Act, the registration of land charges, and then we'll move on to our next topic, the next topic being trusts of land, okay? Again, this is all very important and should really be done in conjunction with your uh, subject studies on equity and trusts, uh, in my opinion at least. And so we will talk about the concept of the trust. Uh, we'll do a little brief introduction of the concept of a trust uh, in this lesson, despite the fact that we are also doing lessons on equity and trusts alongside these. And then we will also talk about the appointment of trustees, including their removal uh, and or their retirement, and then also the powers that trustees have, have over land in uh, benefit for a particular beneficiary. We will then in section five, uh, topic five, should I say, start to talk about co-ownership of land, uh, the nature of co-ownership, the distinction between legal and equitable rights in relation to co-ownership. If you notice, we are talking quite a lot about law and equity and the distinction between the two, hence why it's important to have that introductory topic at the beginning. Um, also, the doctrine of severance for joint tenants, whoopsie daisy, and the uh, methods of severance, the ways in which severance can actually be achieved. Uh, we will then talk about disputes which involve co-owners, the resolution of those disputes, and then also the concept of co-ownership in relation to registered title. Section six is going to look at licenses. We'll talk about what a license is, the types of licenses that exist, including estoppel licenses, and then the doctrine of proprietary estoppel specifically. Section seven, we'll talk about the leasehold, the concept of leases. This includes the nature of the lease, including definitions, the most pertinent definition, of course, being from the case of Street and Mountford, the types of leases that exist, as well as the termination of a lease. Um, the termination of a lease being done through a number of different methods. The most substantive that we're going to be talking about is, of course, the method of forfeiture. Section 8 will talk about the concept of adverse possession. We'll take an introduction to the concept and rationale relating to the idea of adverse possession. We will then talk about possession and the effect of adverse possession in more detail. Before moving on in section 9 to looking at easements, uh, the concept of the easement, uh, the characteristics of the easement, the definition of the easement as laid down in the case of Riel and Park, uh, as well as the basic requirements for the existence of an easement including the creation of express and implied grants of easements and the enforcement of easements and then finishing off easements by talking about rules of prescription section 10 we'll look at covenants the idea of a freehold covenant a restrictive and positive covenants and then we're going to finish off in the end on section 11 which covers the subject of mortgages what a mortgage is the creation of a mortgage as well as the operation of mortgages in the real world <laughs>